Our Father, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the wonderful privilege that we have of fellowship together, to worship you and to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who reveals truth to us and strips away that which is foolish and ignorant. And in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Hope everyone is doing well. If you've been following us along in these studies here in Romans, you know that we are in chapter 11. And we have looked at some amazing truth concerning God's divine, sovereign will as it regards election that he works all things according to the counsel of his own good will and pleasure. We read that also uh, in Ephesians, uh, as well as numerous other passages in the Old Testament and all through the New Testament, that God is in control, that God is sovereign in the lives of his people. More than that, we know that he's divinely, supremely sovereign as it regards all aspects of his creation. I do not believe that God ever makes decisions in the sense that we make decisions, but that God has decreed from the beginning to the end, this is what the Word says, what shall come to pass. Our God, our majestic God, the sovereign God of all creation, the one who hung the stars in the sky, the one who makes the sun to rise and set, the God that we worship is not some scientist in a laboratory conducting experiments to see you know, which thing works, trying this and that, and to try to make something work when it didn't. This is just the stark, cold, I should say warm, reality, the truth of the matter. Many Christians today have the wrong, entirely wrong view of God. As well as, as they're having suffering from an identity crisis, which is very real and very serious. Uh, and by that I mean not understanding who we are in Christ. Not understanding what God, all, all that God has done for them in Christ. Uh, their identity, they, they perceive their identity as being something other than what it is. I want you to take special note of this chapter and, and what we have learned as we've gone through it. Because I think what you're going to find out is that it, when we read a little between the lines, and this is not adding or taking away from the text, it's actually correlating this chapter with other chapters uh, in the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament. It's cross-referencing. It's connecting the dots, so to speak. I think what you're going to discover is, as I, as I did going through this, I meditated long and hard last night about what I was looking at in the 26th verse as it relates to all that we've seen that's gone before us from chapter 1 all the way up to here. And that's what I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about. I hope that you find what I'm about to say a real blessing in your life. I believe that everything that I'm about to say to you can be substantiated from Scripture, that it's not conjecture, it's not presupposition, but it's just these are facts that are taken from Scripture 
and formulated it in such a way as to as to get a clear picture of just how God is working in our lives. The context is Israel, but we are also mentioned in the context. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, not any other way, but as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, of course, he doesn't mean to say that every Jew of every age would be saved. I've received some questions concerning this. But that the time would come when, as a people, they would be delivered, when the nation would turn to God, and when it could be said of them that as a nation they were restored to divine favor, the elect body of them, called the fullness of them in verse 12. The great mass of the nation would be at a specific time in the future delivered. They would be delivered, not because they did anything, but because God promises deliverance to his people, as it is written, meaning according to that which has been written regarding salvation, not that every individual person of their nation will be saved or, or that they're saved by human volition. The context, folks, still deals with election based on promise and shall turn away from ungodliness from Jacob, meaning he will convince them of their ungodliness. He'll give them repentance for it and remission of it. Paul is, is quoting, actually quoting from Isaiah chapter 59, 20. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression. And this is my covenant with them, says the Lord in the, in the following verse, verse 21. Now, is that from, to, or for Zion? Well, though, though Christ did come out of Zion, meaning, meaning a hill or a city in Jerusalem, as well as to Zion, the text is saying that he will come in the future, it's a future tense, out of, ek, out of Zion. I, I believe that to be a reference to the second coming which could also be referring to spiritual Zion, that is, heaven. Uh, I suppose it could be taken both ways. And yet, what do many people say today? All oh, those poor, unfortunate Jews. You know, if only they had believed like we Gentiles have. I mean, now, now folks, do you see how self-righteous that that sounds? No different than, than, than if I said, you know, that awful fellow down the street, you know, if only he was reading his Bible and going to church like I am. So let's not only be high-minded, Romans eleven twenty. well, let's be stupid as well. You know, given the fact that if Israel had not been disobedient, no one would be wearing a cross. No, not one of us would know Christ. We would have no hope at all. You know, thinking that we've replaced Israel because of, of why? Because of some residual goodness in us that, that Israel didn't have. When God concluded all under sin that he might show mercy unto all. Verse 32. Folks, the temptation is to cast blame on Israel because of their unbelief. Yet, verse 8 teaches us that God gave, God gave, his elect people Israel the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. God did that. This is, this is something important to take note of here. And as a result, verse 11, through their fall, salvation continues to come 
unto the Gentile nations. The deliverance of God's elect, the deliverance of, of His elect among the nations. Therefore, although Israel doesn't know it yet, through their disobedience, God has done a great thing, though hidden to them now. A mighty, mighty work of grace. He has shown the nations mercy, that's you and me, the same mercy that the text says that He will turn again and show to them, proving, as I pointed out in previous videos, proving that no flesh will be justified in His sight. Romans 8, or Romans 3.20 for God hath concluded all in unbelief that he might, what? Have mercy upon all, Romans 11:32. And here is where it really got fascinating for me last night as I was meditating on this. As if this is not marvelous enough, we see a further blessing in all of this. This amazing truth folks. It has a practical application in our lives at the present time, and that is that, despite our belief in the contrary, our amazing God takes all, and I mean all, of our failings and works them toward our ultimate good, where death works in us, but life in others. 2 Corinthians 4.12 all this being the very fulfillment of His divine will, pleasure, and purpose. Isaiah 46.10 Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Philippians 2.13 For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Ephesians 1.9 having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Folks, who are we? Listen to me. Who are we to cast blame on his people, who from our limited perspective appear to fail? Our current study has Romans 8.28 woven all through it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to His purpose. No wonder, no wonder, the Holy Spirit through Paul says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. No wonder we were told in, in 8.33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. And folks, as we travel through these chapters, we see the sovereign will of our God displayed through His love, grace, and mercy. And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The verse literally states, God's power in weakness is perfected. So His power is perfected in the weakness of both Israel and the nations, in the lives of His people, you and me, and this ties in directly to our reckoning ourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God, as we learned in Romans 6.11. No flesh will be justified in God's sight. No flesh can produce the righteousness of God which is based on faith, which comes through faith. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We, like sheep, have all gone astray. God has not forsaken His people Israel, nor will He forsake us. He can't, he can't do that. He cannot do that. Because it, 
because it's all based on his promises and his covenants. We are children of promise. These verses, as are all the rest, are given to us that we might have comfort, the comfort of grace in these facts, in, those, in all of those facts, and have confidence, confidence, steadfast confidence in our God and not in ourselves, not in ourselves. I know this is a short video. Um, we're trying to mend fence out here from all the flooding. I love you all, I truly do. I wanna thank every single one of you for all of your love, prayers, support, messages of encouragement. Until next time, rest in him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.